Well, let me invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. We have been, the last few weeks, looking at the the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, I want to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. I invite you to stand with me. It's good to be back with you, and I'll I'll share a little bit about what's been going on in my life and trip and all uh, as I go along here. But I would like to, uh, again, pick it up, and and, uh, we'll start where we started a few weeks ago at uh, Matthew 6, verse 1, and I'd like to read down through verse 13 to this morning. So verse 1, uh, Jesus is speaking. Let us receive his word. Jesus says, be careful. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on, uh, do, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. May God add his blessing to his word. You can be seated. Well, this morning again, I want to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago with this caveat. I would like this message. I I want to talk to anybody here in this room who has been ever dissatisfied with their prayer life if 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 you've ever felt guilty about not praying enough if you've ever felt confused about exactly how prayer works or whether it even works at all if you if you wonder are my prayers heard so just to be clear this morning i I, this is not who i'm talking to If, if prayer comes easily to you if your mind never wanders while you pray, if you've never been troubled by the question of unanswered prayer, if when somebody cuts you off on the freeway, your reflexive response is just, Lord Jesus, bless them. If you win the lottery and suddenly you know you begin to pray and thank God and you say, Lord, forgive me for playing the lottery, but I'm going to make sure I tithe to the congregation. If, if you find yourself being a prayer Jedi this morning, I'm, I'm not talking to you. Instead, I'd like to talk to the rest of us, the ones who sometimes get confused and wonder, am I doing it right? Is this real? This message is for the rest of us because the truth is, and this is a rather strange thing, isn't it? To be human is to pray. It's interesting to me. To be human is, in fact, to pray. It's, it's in moments of great joy. It's in moments of, of great need, in great stress, in great fear, in great sense of guilt. We need someone to speak to, someone to listen. We just can't help it. To be human is to pray, and yet we wonder, is it so complicated? Am I being heard? Are there rules? Am I doing it wrong? Now, in the middle of the greatest talk Jesus ever delivered, he gives us the greatest prayer ever prayed. However, I want you to note, and I think it's important, that before he gives us that prayer, he gives us a couple of warnings. He says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Now, as we have noted, in this section, Jesus talks a lot about rewards here. In this case, the reward for those who pray in front of others is they were seen by other people. 
There's a line in the book, The Catcher in the Rye, that I kind of uh, think reflects this, and I like. It says, if you do something too good, then after a while, if you don't watch it, you start showing off, and then you're not as good anymore. Even prayer can be one of those things that we do to show off. And, and it occurs to me, I suppose, that pastors are especially guilty of this. I'll find when I'm in a group with a group of people, and for instance, we're praying as a group, all too often, instead of really listening and agreeing with someone else who is praying out loud, I'll begin to think about, what am I going to pray what words am I going to use? Am I going to be, you know, a spiritual? Am I going to come across as, as, as knowledgeable and sincere and appropriate? Or am I going to sound foolish and unspiritual or just stupid? Will the people hearing me be impressed? Now, honestly, I don't want to be thinking those kinds of thoughts, but they happen. They're just the reality, and I know better when I'm supposed to be connecting with our Father. But Jesus, therefore, gives us an alternative strategy. He says, but when you pray, go to, into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So think about it. If the reward for those who pray in front of everybody is to be seen, they're seen. But the reward for people who pray simply to God is exactly the same thing. They are seen and heard, and the one who sees them is actually able to do something about their prayers. Now, in Jesus' day, you know, you're, you're talking to poor farmers in Palestine. They did not, for the most part, have private bedrooms like most of us in this room. The only room that would have a door that could be closed and locked would be perhaps a supply room that would have food and tools and maybe a, a, a small animal in it. In fact, this would look like a room where nothing important would ever happen. And yet, Jesus says, it turns out when you're alone in a room like that with God, and he has your full attention, when you're just talking to him in faith and love and transparency, turns out to be the most important place in the world right there in that secret closet it occurs to me that one good reason to pray in private then is if you do it badly only god's going to know about it and it turns out that god is just delighted to have your attention god is just delighted to spend time with you and to hear your concerns and your voices of praise and your love and for you to sit and maybe hear from him too. But of course, this is where it's hard for us too. Jesus addresses this frustration that I think most of us probably have with prayer. God is unseen. And boy, that makes prayer difficult. Prayer is based on the reality of the unseen, but in our culture, in our day, we have become accustomed to the idea and believe that only what is seen and can be touched is real. But the Sermon on the Mount taps into something that is, that is unseen, and yet Jesus very clearly suggests that the kingdom of God is the most real thing there ever has been. And we have an opportunity to, to engage it, if we will. For the last uh, two weeks, as some of you know, I've been in Taiwan, where the Friends Church was celebrating 70 years of ministry and the church is growing and flourishing and what a delight to be with the people there. I, I have, I'd never experienced such honor and grace in my life. It was truly a memorable experience. But last Saturday, they had their celebration service and wow, they literally gave me a front row seat to the service and they treated our small delegation like royalty as members of EFCER, the Friends Church in Eastern Region, as they thanked uh, us for sending them missionaries seven decades ago. They shared a uh, powerful video of how their movement has now grown to over 68 churches. That means that almost every year they plant at least one other church and I will never forget, 
in that uh, grand hall listening to a 300-person choir singing the Hallelujah Chorus. You talk about moving and a bit of heaven. I was there, and I enjoyed every moment of it. I, I, but what made it even more special was how many times I got to talk with pastors and people in the congregations, and I loved hearing their stories of how they had come to Christ because here you are in a culture where 3% of the people are Christians. So when you become a Christian, you're doing it because it's real and Jesus has changed your life and the difference he has made. And I saw that again and again. And day after day, we would meet with the churches. We would meet with the pastors. And without fail, bless my heart, we'd have a banquet. You know, I, I tell you, we'd have a banquet at lunch and then another banquet at dinner. I've never been to so many 10 and 12 course meals in my life. I don't know what all I was eating every time, but it was unbelievable, it was beautiful, and I kept asking myself, why are they being so kind to us? Not because of anything I had done, that's for sure, but the reality was is that 70 years ago, some folks from our churches got in their prayer closet, and they heard from God, And they decided to get on a boat, face the storms and the uncertainty. They learned a new language and culture and loved people like crazy in the name of Jesus Christ. And boy, what a difference it made. They knew how much their lives were different. This this hall filled with people celebrating. There were probably at least 2,300 people in the room celebrating what God had done and the hope that they had. And I would that it happened because someone got in a prayer closet and they heard from God. And when we do that, the world changes. But then Jesus here gives us one of his best gifts. The grandest prayer that has ever been prayed. Of all the prayers that humans have prayed, Jesus gives us this grand prayer. It is the most repeated What strikes me is how simple it is, how short it is, how memorable it is. And he gives it to us as an example. Chris, you know, getting advice uh, from Jesus on prayer is kind of like getting investment advice from Warren Buffett. You know, probably not a bad idea to listen to him. Now, the idea here is that not not that Jesus gives us some rote words that we are to memorize and without thinking just go through them time and time again, but to give us an example that we can think through and absorb into our minds and our hearts as we engage the God of the universe. And amazingly, if you think about it, notice how he begins. Our Father. Our Father in heaven. You know, instantly we're reminded that prayer is not the same as just worrying out loud. Prayer is engaging in a conversation with a person. Prayer is engaging not only in a conversation with a person, but it's a person that loves me, our Father. You know, the truth is, anytime we talk to somebody, we email someone, we always address them. And we don't start a conversation by saying, hey, you, if we know their names or maybe if we have a sense of affection for them, we might even have pet names or terms of endearment. Couples in love will often do this. I I must tell you, I don't know why or how it began, but for years and years now, one of the pet terms that I address my wife as is the, uh, the term Punky Brewster. I call her Punky Brewster. Now, any, anybody familiar with Punky Brewster? Okay, well, some of you, you must be old because uh, the only thing I remember is Punky Brewster was like a sitcom show, maybe back in the 80s or early 90s or something, uh, uh, you know, a freckle-faced teenage girl. But for whatever reason, somewhere along the lines, I've started calling my wife when we're alone. Of course, now you all know about it, but... but <laughs> Punky Brewster, what are we doing today, Punky, or something along those lines, and, and uh, I'm not sure she likes it or anything, but it's just what's happened over the years. But it's one of the ways that, you know, it's 
one thing we share, and I let her know that she's special to me. Now, Jesus, he says, when you pray, this is what you get to say. This is how you can address the creator of the universe, the judge of all things. Call him your father. Our father. Gang, do you you realize the whole gospel is wrapped up in that word, our? God is not just the father of Jesus. Whatever your earthly daddy was, whatever your earthly daddy was like, you have a heavenly father who made you, who loves you, who cares about you, and watches over you. He includes you in your family. In, in Taiwan, they fed us so well, and I could just go on and on about that, but every time we met some new folks, they would give us a gift. Now, Kevin and Grace could probably explain this to me a lot more than I understood, but I just was overwhelmed to the point that I had to get a whole new uh, bag of, or a set of luggage just to bring all the gifts home that we received. It was incredible. But, you know, tea and cakes and pot, uh, 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 different things and knickknacks and, 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 and some of it was significant. But here's the thing, and, and it was so humbling. And I was praying about this, Lord, is this right? Why are they treating me like this? I didn't do anything. I certainly don't deserve this. And then I was reminded and I believe God said to me, Jeff, Jesus said this, when they receive you, they receive me. And the reason they were loving us so much is in demonstrating that love, they were loving me so much. They were just so blessed that he was their father too. And they wanted to express that joy. Folks, this this idea that he is our father changes the way we look at each other. You will never, ever see a human being that God doesn't love. And so when I pray, our father, I remember I am special, but also I am not more special than anyone else I will ever see. The Christian absolutely has no room in their heart for hatred and vitriol of others We have no room for things like racism and anger and vitriol to those who sin differently than we do. Every single human being I see is loved by the Father, heart of God. So we say our Father in heaven, in heaven. Where do you think of when when you think of the word heaven? Let me ask you, which is closer? Heaven or Northridgeville this morning? Well, let me know that let me let you know that Jesus literally says here, our Father is our Father in the heavens. It's plural. And the reason is in the ancient world they thought of different levels of the heavens like like there was the atmosphere where where you had the stars that was one level of heaven then you had the air above them with the clouds and where the birds flew that was a second level of heaven but but then there was the level of heaven that was the air around them we might pray our father who is closer than the air i breathe When you pray, our Father who is in heaven, don't think of somebody who is far away. Think of somebody who is closer than the air that's going into your lungs because that's where God is. He's here right now with you. Our Father in heaven. And then Jesus said, hallowed be your name. And of course, what that means is, God, may your reputation on earth be greatly enhanced. May people come to adore you and worship you and praise you. May they know how truly wonderful you are. Now, I'll say a little bit about this, because it seems to me that often a stumbling block for people is, what is it with God and praise and worship? Why does God need us to praise him all the time? 
Is he some kind of, of narcissist who just needs people to prop up his ego and, and so we're those, we are just those minions to do so? Let me tell you, this is, and I think this is very important for Christians to understand, worship is not something we do to boast God's self-esteem. C.S. Lewis wrote about this in such a beautiful way, but he said when we see something we love, we naturally desire to praise it. In fact, the act of praising doesn't just express our joy, it becomes part of the joy. It completes the joy. Listen, when I got back from Taiwan and my heart was overflowing and I had just experienced so many great things with people and I could go on and on about stories, which I don't have time to share this morning, but I wanted to share my experience with my wife, Mary. And so I told her some of those stories and about some of the people I've met and I showed her some of the pictures to kind of just take us all back there. In a sense, I guess I'm, I'm doing the same thing with you this morning because part of the joy of the experience is to tell someone about it and to express it. Imagine my frustration if this year Ohio State goes on to win the national title, but you told me, well, you can't say anything about it in the pulpit. You can't cheer for them. I, I couldn't live with myself. I, I would, you know, literally, I'd have to say something. It's just something that has to happen. You see, when we see something worthy of praise, part of our joy is to be able to praise. G.K. Chesterton said, I would maintain that thanks are the highest form of thought and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. The worst moment for an atheist is when he is really thankful, but has no one to thank. We have a God who is most worthy of praise, and when you think of who he is, and what he's done, and what he's promised to do, all of us should stand and say, thank you, Jesus, praise you, glorify your name. And when God is fully cherished, when God becomes the, the object of our affection and our praise, we find ourselves fulfilled. We find ourselves at home. Because, friend, you were made to praise him. You were made to glorify her, his name. And that's why Jesus says, go ahead. Hallowed be your name. Then Jesus says, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now let me ask you a question at this point. How many of you, when, when you pray, have ever at least at one time had your mind wander? I'm guilty of that. I, I don't know about you, but this is a big thing for me in prayer. My mind is so pathetically random. I, you know, I'm praying and I'll see this pop up on my cell phone. Hey, uh, go to the site and find out what happened to this 90s sitcom star. And I'll think, well, I gotta find out what happened to this 90s sitcom star, even though I may not have even known who that sitcom, I mean, just even while I was here this morning, Buffalo Wild Wings was texting me and saying, hey, you can get free wings today, you know? And like, just so easy to get off pace. Sometimes when I pray, I start just lapsing into worry. Worry about my kids, my parents, finances, problems, church, you've got your list. The next thing I know, I'm not really praying, I'm just sitting in anxiety. I get so distracted. But for me, if I really think about it, this part of the Lord's Prayer is kind of like that which reorients me. It's a little like if you've ever been in the mall and you go to that place where the map is and it says, you are here. You know, sometimes I need to be reminded in my life because of my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is where I am. I'm in his kingdom. I'm a member of his family. 
He's promised to take care of me. I am here. I am not located mainly in my problems. I am not located mainly in my sin or my guilt. I am located in the kingdom of God. I am alive because he said I am alive. I have hope because he's given me hope because of the cross and the resurrection. I have a hope of heaven. I am a part of his kingdom, and I have the honor of living out his kingdom in my life. And I want to be a part of this great project of his kingdom coming to this earth. I want to be a part of it in our country. I want to be a part of it in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, and in our church. We're up there, comes down here. And when that happens, when I think about his kingdom coming, his will being done, this always leads me to a prayer of surrender. God, your will be done in my life. In my body, with my time, my money, my energy, my word, my affections, my relationships, this day, Lord, your kingdom come in me. Can I just make this point? I know this is a sensitive time in our nation and, and as a result in our church. And maybe I'll have more to say later. I want you to know elections matter. But you know, Jesus never said his kingdom would come through an election. How, how does it come? When we center ourselves in his kingdom. When we decide, Lord, your kingdom come in me, and we live that out with love and care for others the way we serve, the way we sacrifice, the way we stop grasping for power, but by following Jesus and ministering to the sick and the lost and the hopeless and the depressed and the poor and the downtrodden. We're, we're seeing others come to Christ is our passion. I think if, if anything I take away from my trip to Taiwan was their passion to see their neighbors and their families come to Jesus, do we have that, that deep desire to see those things happen in our nation? His, his kingdom comes not just by voting. Jesus says his kingdom comes by praying. May your kingdom come, your will be done. And that means people's hearts are changed. Last Sunday, I had the privilege of preaching in a church. In fact, it was a rather large church. They had three different campuses, and they come to do one celebration where I had the privilege of preaching. They had an overflow room, a, a beautiful kids' choir. The music was outstanding. A lot of things I could say about that experience but another one of our pastors was also preaching at a, another congregation. However, he, he reported afterward that he had prepared a much shorter message than usual because he knew it would have to be translated into Chinese. That means that the sermon would be twice as long. However, he said, you know, I apparently didn't preach long enough because uh, I, I, after it was over, it was evident that they were, the pastor was even a little bit uncomfortable that the service was about to end. So he'd say, you know, in, in our churches, if the pastor is short in the message, we would say, oh, well, it's time to go. You know, we, we'd get all excited and go on to our restaurants or, or go to the, watch the game. But he said, you know what this pastor did? He said the Taiwanese pastor called them all to huddle into groups all around the sanctuary. And he said, I want you to pray together. And so all around the church, this pastor said, you could hear the prayers of God's people. He said, it touched me, it moved me. And it said, you know, just hearing his story, I said, boy, we ought to do that. Now, don't worry, my sermon is not that short, so we don't have time today But maybe we should. Jesus goes on to say, give us today. Give us today. I, I want you to think about the meaning of that. This is so wonderful. If you really 
contemplate what he's saying. It means that, God, I can trust you that you're going to take care of me today. And tomorrow, I'm going to come back to you and know that your character hasn't changed one iota. You'll take care of me then. But today, God, I trust you. And you know, I, I guess if I were honest with you this morning and I went through the course of the, my life, I could honestly say uh, that, that God has always taken care of me one day at a time. Because when I worry, I always worry about the future. I always worry about what is to come. But I found in my life so far, I can face anything if I do it with God one day at a time. Jesus says, this is the prayer. Give us today our daily bread. Give me today what I need. Lord, I need wisdom today. I, I need patience today. I need energy today. I need you today. God, give me today what I need. Today, tomorrow, I'll talk to you then. But God, I trust you today. And then forgive us our debts. A great Christian thinker, Neil Plantinga, said, recalling and confessing our sin is like taking out the garbage. Once is not enough. People sometimes wonder, well, pastor, how often do I need to confess my sin? And my only answer is, well, how often do you sin? And I'll talk more about this next week. But we have this marvelous privilege of confession, forgiveness. And Jesus, of course, ties it with forgiving others. But the next phrase is, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Suddenly, we turn our hearts and we recognize, God, you, you lead me. God, keep me from falling into my worst self. Give me the strength not to fall into destructive habits that can destroy me or destroy the people I love. I recently was made aware of a prayer I had shared several years ago, but I think I'll use it now because it kind of expresses, I think, my at least daily need for God. And it went like this. It, it, it said, Dear God, so far I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy or grumpy or nasty or selfish or overindulgent. I'm really glad about that, God. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm going to need a lot more help. Thank you. Amen. Jesus says there is someone who's willing to lead you and direct you and guide you. And if it isn't God, let me ask you, who's it going to be? He has a light, the light of his Holy Spirit, who will direct you and lead you in the paths of righteousness. And he's saying in heaven, just ask me and I will deliver you. I will show you the way. God, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. Now, I find it interesting, and you probably noticed when you read this, the Lord's Prayer actually ends right there. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, Jesus says. Now, one of the things that I find interesting about Jesus is he has this tendency where he often ends his material on quite a hard and maybe even jarring note. Have you ever noticed this? I mean, read the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't wrap it up with a flowery uh, uh, poem. No, he tells the story at the end of the Sermon on the Mount where a storm comes along and the foolish man builds his house on the sand and he says that it fell and great was its fall. The end. This great sermon and great was its fall. And that's it. Or, or when he told the story of the, of, of the prodigal son, you know the story. The son comes back to the father. The father throws a big party. The brother goes outside. He's resentful and grudging. His father goes outside of the party and pleads with the elder brother, come inside. The end. 
We don't know what happens. We don't know where it goes from there. Jesus often ends things that doesn't wrap it up in a pretty fashion. He, he somehow knows that an unresolved ending leads us to question and wonder, what is the ending? And we have to make a decision. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is saying to us even this morning. Even in this grand prayer, he calls us to a decision. Jesus' followers would add these words, and there's nothing wrong with those words. They're part of the prayer. For yours is the kingdom and the glory, and the power and the glory forever. God, you are large and in charge. Amen. We believe that. But before we get to that, let's ask this question. Who is leading me today? Friend, this morning, what sway have you allowed in your life? And where are you truly headed? Do you belong completely to God? Is he leading you in your decisions, in your relationships? Or is it the evil one? Basil the Great had this to say. He said, hell can't be made attractive. So the devil makes attractive the road that leads there. Can I ask you, who is leading you today? If there's any urgency in me right now, it is this. And I know that there are people in our congregation who love Jesus, and I am so grateful. But I also know that there may be some who still don't know him. Friend, this is your day, and if the Lord is speaking to you and you can honestly say, I haven't been following him, I'm not trusting him, I would say to you, would you come to him? The Bible says, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. If he's speaking to you today and you realize you need him more than ever, then would you confess your need for him? Pray to him, and he will answer that prayer, and he will lead you into a path of righteousness and joy so that his kingdom will come right here, only if you ask him.